Tropical cyclone Koinu moves away from Hong Kong, but its associated showers are still affecting the region. The airport authority to explore improvement measures after thousands of travelers spent hours waiting for taxis last night. Hello and welcome to TVB News. The Hong Kong Observatory cancelled all tropical cyclone warning signals at 4.20 this afternoon. But the winds and storms associated with Koinu, which has now weakened into a tropical depression, continue to affect the coast of Guangdong. 29 people were injured when the storm hit the city. Authorities also received at least 44 reports of fallen trees, three cases of landslides and nine reports of flooding. Jackie Lin reports. After daybreak, the shorelines of Hengfa Chun and the Eastern District continue to be pounded by howling winds and rough swells. Trangwano on the other side of the harbor barely visible. At 7 p.m. Sunday, the observatory issued the number nine increasing gale or storm signal. The power of Typhoon Koinu fell across the territory, especially the southern district near Koinu's eye wall. Pamut Hard 2 was at Lei Chow. Learn Wing Mo, former assistant director of the observatory, said the wind strength had not met the threshold of T9 scientifically at 7 p.m. on Sunday. But it's clear that Koinu's eye wall was inching closer to Lima Island, south of Hong Kong at the time. And if the system moved 30 kilometers closer to the SAR, it would mean a direct hit at the city. And it would precipitate even more chaos when the observatory scrambled to issue the number 10 signal on a short notice, Leung said. After all, the typhoon alerts are here to keep the public safe, he added. Responding to criticisms that the observatory only gave a 15-minute advance notice to the public before issuing T9, the weather expert said citizens should be able to know there was a chance of a higher level typhoon alert when T8 was in force. Leung added the observatory does not have predetermined arrangements for issuing the number 9 or number 10 with prior warning. At around 10 p.m. on Sunday, another warning from the forecaster. Depending on changes in local wind conditions, the observatory will assess the need for issuing the hurricane signal number 10. There was no need to issue signal number 10 in the end. The type of warning was lowered to T8 instead at around midnight. Explaining the logic behind the issuance of T9, the observatory said Koinu had tightly wound circulation. That means it had to get very close to Hong Kong to have the wind speed ratcheted up. When Koinu moved closer to the south of Hong Kong on Sunday evening, the gusts did pick up strength within a short span of time, and that was when the observatory decided to issue T9 for public safety. In lockstep with Koinu, having impinged Hong Kong too was the torrential downpours. The red rainstorm morning was issued around 2 o'clock Monday morning, before the black rainstorm morning took effect at 4 a.m. Wang Tai Sin, Kun Tong, Hong Kong Island and Lantau Island recorded upwards of 300 millimeters of rainfall starting at midnight, leading to sites like these along Mount Butler Road on Hong Kong Island. Precarious scenes along water courses on northern Lantau Island too. Some roads on the island swamped, leaving cars stranded or with mechanical breakdowns. Jack Hilling, TVB News. A large number of travelers were stranded at the airport in the early hours of today because of the near absence of public transport under the increasing gale or storm signal number nine. Mimo Singai reports. This was the scene at Hong Kong International Airport on Sunday night, a long queue of travelers waiting for taxis to reach homes or hotels. For those in the line, taxis were effectively their only option. Most public transport services were already suspended after the observatory issued the number 8 gale or storm signal shortly after midday on Sunday. However, the city's transport system was further diminished when the increasing gale or storm signal number 9 came into force at 7 p.m. last night. For instance, the overground sections of the MTR network stopped operating, including the airport express. At the taxi stand, some people expressed frustration because they had to wait for many hours. I know, I know many, many cities in, around the, the world, and this situation I never seen there. I never seen. Uh, we want, uh, we want to know why uh, hundreds and hundreds of people wait for a taxi. It's a shame. It's a shame. It's a, a bad image to Hong Kong. 
This man said he had been waiting at the taxi stand for five hours. This is crazy. How can you wait so long for a taxi? He said. I wish I could have a bowl of noodles now, but I know that's impossible, he added. While no hot food was provided to the stranded travelers, airport staff did distribute biscuits and water. With the observatory placing the number 9 signal with a number 8 after midnight, the airport express resumed temporary service until 3 a.m., helping thousands of people to leave the airport terminal. By 6 a.m., the airport express fully resumed service. The taxi stand became more or less empty with no more passengers waiting. Taxis were readily available. Under adverse weather, taxis often charge customers more. This passenger said a taxi driver charged him $400 to get to the airport. What can I do? It's number eight, he said. Meanwhile, Stephen Yu, executive director of airport operations at the airport authority, said they had already contacted all the taxi associations in the city once they knew about the number nine signal. But he said very few taxis were running at that hour. User improvement measures will be implemented, such as discussing with the MTR to maintain limited surface of the airport express under adverse weather conditions. Memos 9, TVB News. Taxi drivers imposing heavy surcharges during bad weather are common, especially when most public transport is suspended. Some lawmakers think there should be standards to regulate the practice. Some taxi drivers explain that the surcharge is to compensate for the lack of insurance coverage when driving under typhoon signal number eight. And even with insurance, claiming is difficult. Lawmaker Ben Chan said it is illegal for taxi drivers to request a surcharge. He said he hopes some self-regulating standards can be imposed. But Chan is against banning the practice of surcharges during typhoons because it may result in no taxis willing to work during a storm. After the observatory lowered the number eight signal to the strong wind signal number three before noon, many residents rushed to work. A bustling site at Kuantong MTR station, similarly busy at Wang Tai Sin station. The public transport interchange in Hung Hom was the equivalent of a morning rush hour. The Labor Department reminded employers to be more considerate to their staff during the typhoon. Israel intensified its bombardment of the Gaza Strip today after declaring war and vowing to destroy the enclave's rulers, Hamas. Some Hamas fighters were still holding positions inside Israel, though Tel Aviv said it had taken back most of the dozen or so locations that were infiltrated during Saturday's attack. At least 700 people have reportedly been killed in Israel, and the death toll in Gaza is more than 400. Nazvi Karim has more. Dawn Monday in the Gaza Strip, as explosions from Israeli rockets and artillery pound the area in response to Saturday's unprecedented attack by Hamas fighters. Israel's military said it hit at least 1,000 Hamas and Islamic Jihad sites on Sunday and overnight as they seek not only revenge against Hamas, but an end to the party's rule over Gaza. Israel, which boasts the world's fourth strongest armed forces, is receiving help from the United States. On Sunday, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin sent aircraft carrier USS Gerald R. Ford to the eastern Mediterranean in a show of support for Israel. In New York, Riyad Mansour, Palestine's permanent observer to the United Nations, expressed regret over how the conflict was being portrayed. Regrettably, history for some media and politicians start when Israelis are killed. Our people have endured one deadly year after another. We came to the Security Council month after month, warning of the consequences of Israeli impunity and international inaction. Nazvi Karim, TVB News. The Israeli Foreign Ministry says two Israeli tourists and their Egyptian guide were shot dead on Sunday in the Egyptian city of Alexandria. According to security sources, an Egyptian policeman allegedly carried out the shooting and is now in custody. 
One Egyptian was injured in the shooting, the first such attack on Israelis in Egypt in decades. Egypt was the first Arab nation to normalize relations with Israel, and the two countries cooperate closely on security and energy. However, many Egyptians, like others across the Arab world, continue to sympathize with the Palestinian cause. Cathay Pacific Airways has canceled two flights between Hong Kong and Tel Aviv in view of the situation in Israel. The two flights are CX-7675 from Hong Kong to Tel Aviv and CX-676 from Tel Aviv to Hong Kong. Cathay says it has informed passengers and suggested alternative travel. The airline will continue to monitor the situation. A delegation of U.S. senators led by Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer held talks in Beijing today with Foreign Minister Wang Yi. Schumer told Wang he was disappointed with China's statement on Hamas's attack on Israel. On Sunday, a foreign ministry statement called on both sides to exercise restraint and immediately end the hostilities. Schumer urged Chinese to stand with Israel. Wang spoke before Schumer and did not respond to his remarks while journalists were in the room. Schumer and five other senators arrived in Shanghai on Saturday at the start of a three-country tour that will also take them to South Korea and Japan. The trip comes amid tense relations between the U.S. and China, with both sides trying to lay the groundwork for a meeting between President Xi Jinping and U.S. President Joe Biden. Still ahead, Hong Kong Youth Governing Council will set up a panel to investigate complaints involving the university's vice chancellor. In Afghanistan, the death toll from a strong earthquake jumps to more than 2,400. And an American economics historian wins this year's Nobel Prize in Economics. Welcome back. The Governing Council of the University of Hong Kong held a special meeting to handle a whistleblower's complaints involving its Vice Chancellor Zhang Xiang. After the meeting, the Council announced it is setting up a panel to look into the matter. The panel will report to the Council within 12 weeks, and the Council will decide if any follow-up action is necessary. Jackie Lin reports. Council members of the University of Hong Kong arrived at campus in the afternoon to attend the special meeting. They included council members Abraham Sheck and Charles Lee. Both are appointed by Chief Executive John Lee, who is also HKU's chancellor. Also in attendance were council member Vincent Cheung and the council's undergraduate representative Casey Chigyao Hong. Chick said the meeting should not be a platform for political judgment. Instead of pointing fingers across the media, it's fair to the president if probes are conducted through an investigation committee, he said. The unraveling saga began when an anonymous email listed a string of misconduct allegations against HKU president and vice chancellor Professor Zhang Xiang. They include a claim that Zhang hired a medical dean for HKU and pro-vice chancellors or vice principals through a U.S. headhunter. Zhang was also said to have transferred a scholarship donation from a mainland company to an account controlled by the president's office. Hitting back, the HKU president said the allegations constitute serious defamation. HKU's council was set to convene a special meeting to discuss the matter earlier, but had it postponed. On the eve of today's meeting, two senior academics invited by Zhang Xiang to join HKU made public their support for the embattled president. They include Professor Ma Yi, who chairs the Department of Computer Science at HKU. Ma said much unverified and confidential information had been leaked to the media and the public. Finding the whistleblower's motives very suspicious, he said the moves are aimed at defaming the president and the university. He urged the council to handle the case in a rigorous and confidential manner. Also backing Zhang is chemistry chair professor Francis Doddart, who received the Nobel Prize in 2016. The academic said in a letter published by the media that Zhang's vision for HKU and his sense of purpose are invaluable. Stoddart also said HKU requires the support of all its members. He urged those attacking Zhang to reflect on their stance. Jacqueline, TVP News. 
According to Afghanistan's Taliban administration, more than 2,400 people have been killed and at least 9,240 injured during earthquakes that shook the country on Saturday. Meanwhile, diplomats and aid officials have expressed concern about the impact Taliban rule has had on the nation's ability to cope with natural disasters. Daniel Rao tells us more. Rescue workers are scrambling to pull out survivors and the dead from beneath the rubble two days after the northwestern city of Herat and its surroundings was struck by the deadliest earthquakes to rattle Afghanistan in years. A Taliban government spokesman said hundreds were still trapped, more than a thousand hurt, and over 1,300 homes destroyed. Herat Health Department officials said the bodies of more than 200 people killed during the quakes had been taken to various hospitals and military bases, adding most of them were women and children. The head of the Taliban political office in Qatar told the media that food, drinking water, medicine, clothes and tents are urgently needed for rescue and relief. Neighbors Pakistan and Iran have offered to send rescue workers and humanitarian aid. China's Red Cross Society offered cash relief aid. Afghanistan's healthcare system, reliant almost entirely on foreign aid, has faced crippling cuts in the two years since the Taliban took over, and much international assistance, which had formed the backbone of the economy, was subsequently halted. Diplomats and officials say concerns over Taliban restrictions on women and competing global humanitarian crises are causing donors to pull back on financial support. The Islamist government has ordered most Afghan female aid staff not to work, although with exemptions in health and education. Experts believe the death toll is likely to rise further as information comes in from more remote parts of a country where decades of conflict have left infrastructure in a shambles and relief and rescue operations difficult to organize. Daniel TVB News. The Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences announced today that American economic historian Claudia Golden has won the 2023 Nobel Economics Prize for having advanced the understanding of women's labor market outcomes. The prestigious award, the last of this year's crop of Nobel Prizes, is worth around one million U.S. dollars. Golden is only the third woman to win the Nobel Economics Prize. In a statement, the prize-giving body said this year's laureate in the economic sciences provided the first comprehensive account of women's earnings and labor market participation through the centuries. The Academy added her research reveals the causes of change as well as the main sources of the remaining gender gap. The economics prize is not one of the original prizes for science, literature and peace created in the will of dynamite inventor and businessman Alfred Nobel. It was a later edition established and funded by Sweden's central bank in 1968. That is the news. Thanks for watching. Pearl Magazine is up shortly. Bye for now.